of uh, uh, things related to the class model, homework, etc. One is that if anybody has got any questions or problems with the uh, online portal, you can send an email to support at edcast.com. So we are committed to supporting us with our uh, users very uh, effectively. So this is a uh, note of this email. And then uh, you still have some problems with uh, registration. And uh, we have, we have got quite a few duplicate registrations on the portal. So we want only your iitb.ac.in email addresses on the portal. Your roll number can be, the roll number is preferred, but if you switch the roll number to your first name, last name, or something like that, that's okay too. But uh, we need to have to do one enrollment on the online portal per student, okay? Uh, so uh, please take care of that. Uh, so today we've got a very exciting class. It should be a lot of fun, so let me tell you what it is. So basically we are going to get started with uh, looking at a case study of a startup that started acting like a large company. And after that, Something that all of you guys probably enjoy even more than this entrepreneurship course, which is actually the first course uh, in the Desai Safety Guide, Safety with Vice Name, uh, Center for Entrepreneurship. So they've also sponsored, Bharat Desai has sponsored the Gym Hana and the Swimming Pool. How many of you guys use the Gym Hana and Swimming Pool? Everybody. So remember the time tip for that. And uh, Prashant Ranade has sponsored the tennis courts. You guys play tennis, anybody? Uh, small number of people. Okay. So, anyway, between the two of them, they've given back a lot to the alumni, which is IIT, Bombay, and, uh, they, and you know, we want to have a great relationship with these amazing, these successful entrepreneurs and now kind of global corporate uh, citizens. So, what we are doing, uh, Bharat and Prashant are going to be coming here in about 
5.45 p.m. So I'm going to give about 30 minutes where I want to cover uh, a very exciting case study of an IIT Delhi grad who probably uh, is also uh, got a great reputation on his own right. So we're going to uh, discuss a person from Peter Raven and his uh, entrepreneurial journey. And, uh, and uh, go through this. Okay, so let me kind of talk a little bit about what you're seeing on the screen right now. Uh, and the first bullet is the presentation that you know, all of you guys can download if you want. And after that, we already uploaded the PNC, the Business Model Canvas presentation that I made in an accelerated fashion. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, because we had Bhavan Pandya who was going to do his case study. But uh, I also discussed the BMC in a lot more detail with my class at IIT Gandhi Nagar in 90 minutes. And I've taken that, those my videos, and uploaded them for you to review because they include a lot of anecdotes and examples of how the nine elements of the BMC, the customer segment, the value proposition, apply to Opti and to Selectica. So you'll see a lot of that in the five additional videos that I've got there. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, and then, uh, so if anybody has uh, questions on the BMC before I get started on uh, what we're going to start doing? Okay, very good question. So, okay, let me kind of cover something here because the value proposition is something for the offer that you make to your customer. It is, what are you selling? Like, let's assume that there are two companies making soap. So are they selling soap to the customer? If they're selling soap, then the customer wants one, will decide to buy one. So, next time you buy the other soap. So, this company does not get any competitive advantage selling a soap, right? So, value proposition, is the additional features or uniqueness that you provide in making the offer. You provide better packaging, better smell, better fragrance, better shape, better size, better cost, better delivery. What is it special that you are offering that will make the customer buy your product? Right? So that's the value proposition. Now, the point I want to make, if you don't be very clear, is that the value proposition is consumed by folks in boxes 2, 3, and 4. The customer segments, then essentially the customer relationship that you're going to have to make the sale, and the channels that are going to get the product to the customer, right? So this is all customer side. And one thing that you get back from the customer is revenue. So the revenue goes right below the customer costs. On the right side, on the left side, is all the effort it's going to take to deliver the value proposition. So you have your key activities, key resources, and key partners. And what does it, it take in order to deliver product? Cost. So that's why cost is right below key activities, key resources, and key partners, right? So and when you subtract the cost from the revenue, you get your earnings. So the way I remember is value proposition in the middle, cost-oriented activities on the right-hand side, the, all the customer-related activities on the right-hand side, all the production activities on the left-hand side, and then I've got my revenue and my cost. So, Sure, go ahead. I think uh, all of you must have seen the same videos, two days back in the newspaper. 
about mobile phones uh, situation. Is that right? Anyone remember that? What was the big announcement? Yeah. Micromax has become the number one mobile seller in India, bigger than the Samsung and Nokia's. So what it is that Micromax is doing? That is what we see at the value proposition. What is Micromax giving? It is giving price, battery life, charge between uh, two charges, how much you can have. So that is what really distinguishes it from the other players and it creates its own market.
automated uh, factories for packaging and delivering goods. And uh, they launched the product in Q3 of 99, so about just two, two years later. And uh, within two months of launching the product and service, they actually took it public and the uh, entire public, investing public was so excited about it <coughs> that they raised $400 million and had a market capitalization of $8.5 billion with an income of $500 million uh, within two and a half to three years. And what's interesting is that less than a year later, they went bankrupt. It spent $800 million <coughs> And uh, all the money was gone. So this is probably the most amazing startup story. Most startups, a million dollars is good for two to three years. These guys started the company and spent eight hundred million dollars in three years and went bankrupt. And essentially, it was the end of the company. Anyway, so um, yeah, go ahead. Very important case study for 
all entrepreneurs understand the very important messages. But uh, when you listen directly to the person who created that web van and lived the web van situation for three years as you know, they raised money, they were successful, a world thought that they were going to change the world to where tiny dogs set apart. To listen to his perspective on how it all happened is you know, a classic. And uh, what I will try to do is, uh, after we have done the case study and so on, and we have done the assignment, I will try and get them online with Skype or Google Hangout and all these things, so that you can interact directly with it. And if you guys have any questions, uh, you should just you know, keep it for them. Okay, so going back to, in a nutshell, why uh, So, in a nutshell, the first eight points are, you know, what the textbook writes about, right? So, the, the author of that book came up with eight points because these are really very important for every entrepreneur to understand. So, the first point is that I know what the customer wants. And, obviously, today, like, there are successful companies that offer online grocery in UK and US and very soon it's probably going to happen worldwide. So, unfortunately... Let me give you an example. You see this? Localbanya.com. You have seen that. Localbanya.com? Okay. Yeah, it's already started in India. So, you know, that capability or uh, that value proposition obviously makes sense. But there is some specific detail that you make a mistake on if you don't talk to the customer. If you, so you can, you can understand the major value problem. But the subtleties that make a difference between whether a company will succeed or not are messed up. For example, you find that ultimately it was tomatoes that was the biggest problem for, for uh, a web brand. They could deliver rice, they could deliver sugar, they could deliver milk, or standard products with no problem. But when the housewife wanted tomatoes, she wanted them a certain type, and it was impossible for the computer and the warehouse and the delivery system to deliver effectively. It turned out that tomatoes was the problem. Anyway, so, you know, I know what the customer wants. It's something that you can only figure out if you actually go ahead and talk to the customer why you're developing, before you're developing the product, why you're developing the product, and after you finish developing the product, so you're doing the test and so on. So it's something that you have to keep in mind all the time. Customer is king at this stage. Second thing is I know what features to build. So they need some assumptions as to like, you know, um, how the delivery will happen. Now it turned out that most housewives did not like a strange person coming to their doorstep to deliver goods. They were afraid of, you know, a stranger coming to the house and knocking on the bell or on the door. So, you know, one would say, come on, you know, he's a web man, web man guy. And uh, you know, they did not take into uh, they did not take particular attention to how to establish the identity of the person that actually delivers. So they let you know people wear any clothes and go there rather than postman always wears a certain uniform. Why? So when the house tribe <coughs> sees the person, the stranger coming in who's wearing a postman's dress, okay, says so the postman don't have to worry about it. Same thing with the policeman. The reason why they wear uniforms so that we don't have to see his ID card, nobody is a policeman or a postman or somebody that you can trust 
That's why you know FedEx, all these people wear uniforms so that. But these guys have not thought of that, so they found that basically like housewife did not like this, and they said, hey, we don't want any stranger coming to our house and stop them. Uh, they focused on an off state. So, you know, these guys had raised so much money and they'd already taken the company coming public, so they knew that they had to hit that particular deadline of getting the product out. Now, they built a very complex software system for doing the online ordering and all that, and a warehouse automated, fully automated system that can go from shelf to shelf, shelf to shelf, and go and package up a, 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 a bag which can automatically be put into the van and shipped out. So they focused on that, and as a consequence, you know, all kinds of bugs everywhere, but they were just shooting to get it done. Uh, so rather than experiment, by right, take a little bit of time, figure out what needs to be done, what features, you know, any resistance to this kind of service, etc. They raise so much money, they have no choice but to go ahead and just start executing. Let's get it done. Right? Um, then he talks about job title versus getting the job done. What he meant here is that when you create a, a great expectation in the marketplace, you hire all super heavy <coughs> You hire the best salesman. You hire the best marketing person, the best financial officer, the best customer support person. Now, you get them from all the big companies. And these guys, when they come in, you know, they want to have the best sales team under them. So they hire 20 sales teams, open up offices everywhere, which represent high and high quality. But they're signing expensive leases in all the big cities, they're hiring expensive people, and, like, and you know, before you know it, cost starts kicking off. Uh, the person who's creating the factory, you know, in order to have revenue that supports such a high market valuation of $8.5 million and so much money in the bank, they say, hey, we've got San Francisco factory almost ready, but even before it's tested, debugged, everything, let's buy uh, buildings and or start buying land or renting land setting up factories and start the construction process on another 10 or 15 different or 10 or 15 different factories to support to supply to Chicago, New York, Dallas, um, Miami, wherever, right? So they're building up factories and so on, so they're making commitments to spend a big amount of money, you know, so spending a big amount of money with all kinds of people. Uh, and now sales and marketing execute to lead the plan. So, you know, everybody says, you know, San Francisco is going to have 50,000 customers in three months, and they're going to have a million customers in two years, and for that we need to have so much uh, inventory place, a warehouse that is so big, and all of that stuff. So, we start doing all of that, and everybody is doing, is spending money at a very rapid pace. And so then you end up with something called premature scaling. All the problems are not being solved, but you start, you know, building up a big company. So small problems should have been small. Only San Francisco warehouse have been built now becomes ten times bigger or more if you have ten factories to pick. <coughs> so that's called premature scaling. And then finally, what ended up ends up being a company. It's called management by crisis leads to a death spiral. So instead of doing what is right, you start doing whoever is shopping uh, the loudest in the company. So you know, engineers are saying that you know uh, the software is not working. So let's stop everything to start to get the job done, to get the software fixed. The manufacturing people are saying that you know I've got to deliver so many things. 